right, AP Physics 2, Unit 3, um, one of our larger, more important units. Uh, lesson A, uh, multiple choice explained. We're going to break this up into multiple videos. This first video is questions 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13. All right. And if you think you have a lot of work to do in this one, I have to go through and explain every single one of them to a computer screen. And it's the summer. So don't you complain. You were at the beach when I was doing this. Well, maybe not. It was like COVID and stuff. So you were probably just home playing video games. But you get the idea. If this video is being used like eight years from now, if I'm still teaching, there was this like pandemic thing years ago when you were a kid. And you might remember it. Anyway, let's move on. Number one. Conducting spherical shell of radius R has charge Q uniformly distributed on its outer surface. Of course, because it has to. Um, the graph above represents electric field strength E versus distance R from the center of the spherical shell. So not from the surface, but from the center of the shell. Which of the following graphs best represents E versus R when the charge on the spherical shell is doubled by 2Q? All right, so here's what we, the big idea here is this. First of all, is that inside the shell, if you have a conducting shell, and it's got charge on it, the charge will evenly distribute to produce so that there is no electric field inside the, the charged uh, conducting shell. None. And it doesn't matter how much charge is on it. There's still none. So what we're looking for here is that's why you see when you look at this, that this segment of the graph is down here at zero. This is inside less than one radius. This is inside of the shell. And then, bam, as soon as you leave the shell, it leaps up. So our answer needs to also have that along the bottom. It, that will not rise. It doesn't matter how much charge you put in it. The, the charge will arrange itself so that there is no net field inside the shell. So I'm going to rule out anything that doesn't have that. So right away, no no, and hell no. Sorry for the language. Um, yeah, just no. Okay, so we're down to two options right off the bat. If I know that one fact, I'm down to these two options. Now, this one shows the uh, field strength of being three tick marks up. This one shows the field strength of being one, two, three, four, five, six tick marks up. The original one was three, but we doubled the charge. Which one do you think is the answer? You'd be right. It's D. So you can common sense your way out of it at that point. The electric field will always be strongest right near the surface and then decrease as you go away, and it will decrease as a square because as a one over squared, because that's Coulomb's law. Once you get away from once you start getting away from the sphere, it basically acts like a point charge. So the irony here is it acts as if all the charge is at the center of the sphere in a way. But actually, well, well, at least it acts when you get far away, it does. All right, that's that one. Moving on. Hollow metal sphere, one diameter, uh, one meter in diameter, carries a charge of four microcoulombs. The electric field at a distance of two meters from the center of the sphere is most nearly. All right, so this is what I was saying just a moment ago. We can treat this like a point charge. So we can, ironically enough, the field strength, even though there is no field strength here, it, these two points that are outside the shell will act as if all the charge is located at the center here. So we're going to use Coulomb's law and use this as a, as a point charge. We're going to say that the electric field, well, the electric field part of Coulomb's law, is K... Q on the sphere divided by your distance away squared. Notice for electric field, there's only one Q. So that's 9 times 10 to the 9th times 4 microcoulombs. That's 4 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs divided by a distance. Now you are 2 meters from the center, so that's going to be 2 squared, or 4. Now if we punch that out, what we can do, if you want, is do 9 times 4, then divide by 4. Aha, wait a second. 9 times 4, divide by 4, so you're really getting 9. So it's got to be this one. 
um, sorry, order of magnitude says this, we'll assume it comes out to this, right? Ten nine times yeah, it's gonna be a three. Yeah, that's but then the nine is all we need to know. So there's a quick way out of this. You can just multiply, let me show you what I was talking about. If I multiply this times this and then divide by this. I'll get this part of the number, the, the non-power of 10. And since they're all different, I figured I'll just do that and see which one of them matches up here and just trust that the order of magnitude works out. Because um, it has to otherwise. So when I did that, I realized I had 9 times 4 divided by 4. Ah, it's just 9. So it's problem. there isn't a lot of you have to get a calculator out for it, which they like to do on these. They like to do it so that if you're quick about it, mentally quick about it you can see that you don't need a calculator so I think it's going to be a and I have the answers here in front of me and I'm checking and so far I'm, I'm batting a thousand hydrogen atom is isolated in a vacuum chamber the electron is now separated from the proton and moved a distance one centimeter away let FG be the magnitude of the gravitational force between the proton and the electron that will be ridiculously small and let Fe be the magnitude of the electrical force between the proton and electron, very large compared to the gravitational. How does the ratio change as the particles are separated? Hmm. Well, let's see. The ratio is going to be gravitational. So big G, mass of the proton, mass of the electron, divided by this distance between them squared over the force of electrical force, which is K, Q of an electron, Q of a proton, divided by that same distance away squared. So what's interesting is, is if we take this bottom fraction and we flip and multiply, the R squareds go away. And I end up with K, Q2, Q, sorry, Q proton, Q electron, over G, mass of proton, mass of electron. So interestingly enough, all that is a constant that depend, it, no matter how far away I move them, that ratio is going to stay the same. Because I don't change this, I move them apart, I don't change Q and I don't change their mass, and these constants of course don't change. So I would say A. Hey, same non-zero value for all separations. Interesting. You s double check your algebra. You see, I got the R squared is going to cancel there, right? When we flip and multiply. Actually, when we flip and multiply, I have the I have this reversed. My apologies. So I should have. Let's just run through it. G mass proton mass electron over R squared times R squared over K Q proton Q electron. The R squareds will cancel. And I'll have the inverse of this. I'll have the G on top. G, mass proton, mass electron, divided by K, Q, proton, Q electron. So this would be the actual, but it'd still be constant. So my conclusion wouldn't have changed, even though I messed up my algebra. Positively charged rod is initially far from a neutral grounded conductor and is then brought close to the conductor without touching it. If the ground wire is removed while the charging rod is near the conductor, what is the net charge on the conductor? Well, if you bring... So here's our conducting object, which is connected to ground. And you bring a positive rod close. So all the positives leave. Positives are out because they're repelled by these, leaving negatives. If you then cut this wire, the charge you've in, by induction, you've charged this thing negatively. So I would say negative. So the ground allows a path for the positive charges that are on this conducting object to leave. And then if you cut that wire to ground, they can't get back and you've charged, you've left only negatives or an excess of negatives on this one. A small amount of charge is placed on both an isolated conducting sphere and an isolated insulating sphere. For both spheres, the charge is added to a small area at the top of the sphere. After a few seconds, 
where on each of the spheres is the charge it was added? Okay, so this is the idea that this question is pretty much straight up asking you. You should know two things. For a conducting object, the charge will always spread out evenly on the on the outside surface of the object. Always. Because it, the, the, the excess charge will repel each other and they'll all want to get as far away as they can, which will by nature create an even distribution. On an insulator, charge stays wherever you put it. Because it can't move. It's not a, on an insulator. So wherever you put the charge, it stays. So, since you put it at the top, the, I would look for any answer, answer that says the insulator is at the top as well. So this one works. This one works. So we're down to two. The conducting sphere, this will not work. It will go, it'll spread all over the surface. So I would go with C. But that, that fact right there is just a, 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 just a straight up fact that you need to know. An electron E and a proton P are simultaneously released from rest in a ele uniform electric field E. As shown above. I don't have the diagram. Hopefully we'll make it work. Assume the particles are sufficiently far apart so the only force acting on each particle after its release is due to the electric field. So they don't mess with each other. At a later time, when the particles are still in the field, the electron and the proton will have the same. Okay. So they're going to experience the same force. Because the force that they're going to feel is the electric field strength times their charge. And they have the same charge. So the forces on each of them, the force on the proton and the force on the electron, are the same. However, the proton has much more mass than the little electron. The mass of a proton is much more than the mass of an electron. So their accelerations are going to be very different. The proton is going to have a small acceleration because of its bigger mass. And the electron is going to have a large acceleration. And so therefore, I would expect later on the electron to be moving faster because it would have sped up faster. But they'll still have the same force. So the only thing that they're going to have the same, they won't have the same speed. because they, right? they won't have, they'll have exactly opposite directions of motion because one's positive, one's negative. So no, no. Because they don't have the same speed, the electron is going to move a much bigger dis displacement. So no. Magnitude of acceleration? Nope. They're going to, they're different. So it's got to be magnitude of the force. They have the same force acting on them. Three particles having charges of equal magnitude, Q, are fixed at the corners of an equilateral triangle. As shown above, two of the charges are negative, the other is positive. Which of the following vectors best represents the direction of the resultant field at point P in the center of the triangle? So let's see. We'll just break it down as follows. We'll call this one the red charge, this one the green, and this one the blue. All right. For the red, the field is going to go the direction a positive charge would go, so it would go this way, we'll say. And we'll leave that length. Okay. Then for the green, it's going to be away from that point by the same amount. And for the blue, it's going to be towards that by the same amount. Hmm. So if I add all those vectors, I certainly would expect a vector that would point somewhere, or actually probably in the direction of the green one. Right? Probably in this direction right here. I'm going to go with A on that one. And I'd be right. Two point charges, Q and, neg and negative 2Q, are fixed in place at a distance 2D from each other, as shown above. What is the magnitude of the net electric field at point P, which is midway between the two charges. All right, so the magnitude of the field. So the field at this point is going to be, first of all, 2Q is going to point this way, and Q is going to point this way as well, but be half as large, because it's only got half the charge. 
So what would be the charge on just by the positive Q? It would be, not the charge, the field. So the field strength by this one would be KQ over D squared. The, char the electric field by the negative 2q is going to be just the magnitude, not worrying about the direction. It's going to be k2q over d squared. But it's the sum of both of them that's the net field. So I have 2kq over d squared plus 1kq. So I have 3 k q over d squareds. I'm going to go with e on this one. So knowing that you got to know that you know the direction of field points in this case always points in the direction that a positive test charge would go. That's why I know they're both to the right and that they're going to add together. If you made Q over here negative, then they would work against each other, and I'd subtract. But in this case, they work with each other, so a diagram helps. Two initially uncharged metal spheres are mounted on insulating stands and placed in contact with each other, as shown above. If a student brings a positively charged insulating rod near sphere 1, sphere 2 is then removed, and the rod has finally moved away, what's the charge on sphere 1? So this is sort of like grounding. When they're, when they're touching like that, so here are the two spheres, and they're touching, and the rod is close to them, so positive charge on the rod. That means positives are going to get as far away as they can, leaving extra negatives closer. They're going to be attracted over here. So that's one of the rods there, and they're connected. If you, while the rod's there, if you take this one away, you're taking away positive charges and leaving this one with a negative charge. And isolated positive charge Q is in the plane of the page, as shown above. The directions of the electric field vectors at points P and T are also in the plane of the page are, are given by which of the following? Okay, so let's see if we can understand this question. It's oddly worded. So at point P Q is positive, so then the field vector will point this way, because it will repel. The field vector here will repel this way. So I would say left and down, or left and towards the bottom of the page. See if they see what else we have here. Left and towards the bottom of the page. That's what I would go with. Once again, just understanding the direction that an electric field points. It'll always point in the direction that a positive test charge would go. So they told us this was positive, so there's repulsion here. The field's going to go that way. All right, I believe this ends this video.